Welcome and good afternoon. I'm Bob Axelrod, Walgreen Professor for the Study of Human Understanding uh, here in the Ford School and in the uh, Department of Political Science. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today on behalf of the International Policy Center at Ford and our co-sponsor today, the Center for the Middle East, uh, Middle Eastern and North African Studies. And as you, we're pleased to have Rami Kamari here today. And I look forward to your talk very much. Uh, but before we hear from him, let me introduce Norman Bishara, who will tell you a little bit more about our speaker. Norman is an assistant professor of business law and ethics at the Ross School of Business. He has a master's degree in public policy from the Ford School, and he's also chair of the Ford School Alumni Board. He holds a law degree from Cornell and currently conducts research on corporate governance, international legal reform, and business ethics in the developing world. He's also a project consultant with the Lebanese Transparency Association in Beirut, where he co-authored the first Lebanese Code of Corporate Governance. Norma, it's a pleasure of introducing our speaker. Uh, thanks, Bob, and a thanks, special thanks to, of course, the Center for Middle East and North African Studies and to the International Policy Center, Jan Svegner, the director, who couldn't be here today, but also a special thanks to Zana Quasar, uh, who's on staff of the center and who put together all the details of Rami's visit from start to finish. Um, we're lucky to have Rami Khoury here. Um, he comes to us uh, from Beirut by way of Boston, um, which gives you a sense of how much he travels. Um, he, if you can construe Rami's career and professional, uh, personal and professional lives, you can sort of look at it in terms of a, a long journey. Um, he grew up in Switzerland and the US and Jordan. Uh, he now lives in Beirut. He um, is often in the US. Uh, he is affiliated with several universities and great policy schools. Um, the Kennedy School, uh, Fletcher, uh, the Fletcher School at Tufts, Syracuse's Maxwell School, as well as um, Harvard's Kennedy School, and uh, University of Chicago's Harris School as well. I don't know if I mentioned that. Um, but in practice, he's still a journalist, as he is by training. Uh, he holds two degrees, uh, an undergraduate and a graduate degree from Syracuse University. And as a journalist, he still practices. He uh, contributes at least two um, uh, pieces per week in syndication. Um, I don't know if you saw his most recent uh, New York Times op-ed piece, but it is a must read. And But many of you know him through that writing, but you also know him through other outlets. So uh, you may have seen him on, uh, not only in the New York Times, but you see him on various US shows, such as the Charlie Rose Show, or you may recognize his voice uh, for the Diane Reem Show, where he's uh, um, often contributing to the Friday News Roundup in the international section. Um, but Rami is a bit more than that. He's also the director of the Islam Ferris Center at the American University in Beirut and a founding director, which really gives you a sense of how much influence he has there, uh, not just in journalism, but also as a policymaker in the region. Um, in that sense, he often is seen as the voice of the Middle East, translating really difficult and complex Middle East policy problems um, for audiences all over the world, particularly in the US. Um, not an easy task to stay impartial, uh, but to be still be candid and critical and yet very deeply respected. Um, so we're very lucky to have him here today. And I now turn over the mic to our guest, Rami Khoury. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Norm and Bob. And uh, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted to be at the University of Michigan. I was trying to time my visit so I can catch a football game or a basketball game, and it didn't work very well. They told me that there's a hockey game outdoors uh, Saturday, so I'm getting out of here tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I, I'm into American sports, but I'm not sure I could quite handle that. But I will be back and watch a football game, and congratulations for getting into a bowl game this year again. Like your team, like mine, Syracuse, is, is on the up and up again, so the future is bright. I want to thank uh, the International Policy Center and the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Studies um, for co-hosting this, and particularly Norm Pshara and Zaina Quaiser for all their uh, work in uh, uh, having this uh, happen, and I'm delighted to, to be here with uh, old friends and family, cousins and friends from high school days and um, uh, acquaintances from over the years. And I'm, uh, as Norm mentioned, I'm a journalist by background. I've spent about 40 years uh, working in the Middle East, mostly uh, or totally in the Middle East, um, 
working uh, as a journalist, uh, reporting, writing, analyzing, observing, trying to understand uh, what's happening in the Middle East. And I'm in late middle age, I decided to try to gain some respectability and moved into academia. So I'm masquerading as a, as a semi-academic by running this policy institute at the American University of Beirut. Uh, but I'm really um, um, here to share with you my analyses and ideas that I generate from my journalistic work, which primarily means going around the region, talking to people all over the Middle East, um, interacting with all kinds of people from all levels of society in all different kinds of countries, and um, going to Iran, uh, going to uh, the Arab-Israeli uh, conflict areas, uh, Israel, Palestine, um, uh, all over the region. I've traveled in the last 40 years, and, and, and I've um, watched the development of the region from inside the Middle East in the last four decades or so, and I'd like to share with you my analysis of what I believe is actually going on in terms of the, um, the new power equations that are emerging in our region, which are woefully, almost criminally underreported in this country, as those of you who follow the Middle East probably know that the American press is not very good at covering the realities of the Middle East. It tends to be superficial, uh, biased, uh, ideologically driven, uh, emotionally exaggerated, um, and has many faults. And, and I know this from working with many colleagues in the American media. The American media does some excellent reporting, but not on the Middle East, unfortunately, not on the Arab-Israeli conflict, not on the Arab world, and now not on the Islamic world either. Uh, so I would like to try to possibly uh, uh, give you a more accurate view, possibly, or maybe a more complete view a more nuanced view of what I believe is actually going on uh, in the region. And I think there are some really very important things that are going on uh, that have been going on for the last uh, 20 years or so and that deserve uh, much more, uh, I think, uh, accurate and dispassionate uh, analysis. Um, the area I'm talking about is essentially the Arab world uh, mainly, uh, but what I'm saying also applies to a little bit to Turkey and Iran and Israel in some cases, uh, but I'm mainly uh, talking about, about the Arab world um, at one level and, and, and other things, a slightly broader perspective. But when you look at the Middle East, you essentially, I believe, have four players. The Arabs, the Israelis, the Turks, uh, and the Iranians. Uh, you also have, those are the four indigenous players, and you have external players. The United States is now engaged in two wars in the region, has 20 or 30 military bases all over the area. Um, and so the, the U.S. is a major player uh, as well now. And some of the other foreign forces, the Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese, are there in economic terms, cultural terms, political, military, in different ways. But essentially we're talking about Arabs, Turks, Iranians, and Israelis who interact to create the realities uh, that are um, defining our region today. The first point I want to make is that all of the realities of our region, every dimension of life in the Middle East, and certainly in the Arab world, is in the process of significant and ongoing change. This is a region that is often uh, portrayed in the Western um, um, and uh, American media, is often portrayed as one-dimensional, as you know, the Arabs are like that, the Muslims are like that, this is how they are, and this is uh, how we have to deal with them. The reality is that uh, this region is neither monolithic in its behavior or attitudes or thinking, um, and nor is it static. It's constantly uh, evolving. Every level of society, uh, and I would mention six, the citizen, this community, the society, the government, the country as a whole, the region of the Middle East, and the Middle East and the world. Those six levels of analysis, every one of them, is in the process of significant and ongoing uh, change. Uh, all of these dimensions have been changing, uh, I believe, most seriously since the end of the Cold War, about 20 years ago. Uh, and I can see there's some people in this room, like me, old enough to remember the Cold War. Uh, and, uh, and as you know, around 1990, when the Cold War ended, there were a lot of changes uh, around the world. Um, and there were a lot of changes triggered by the end of the Cold War in the Middle East, uh, except, except for uh, 
really two major changes. Foreign military interventions didn't end, and uh, no democracy took place, no, democrat no democratic transformation took place in the Middle East, um, unlike much of the rest of the world. But the, all the main aspects of life started to evolve because of the uh, end of the Cold War, because of economic pressures, because some Arabs, uh, Egypt and Jordan, signed peace treaties with Israel. There were a combination of reasons why this region started to evolve more dynamically. And what happened really in, in the early 1990s, or really started in the late in the 1980s uh, with economic pressures and, um, and the, the, which forced some governments to liberalize in the Arab world, not democratize, but to liberalize, to open up and to allow their people more space to behave as normal people in politics and economics and culture and arts and the different aspects of life. What happened was that a whole series of uh, forces were unleashed in Arab societies where people could uh, express themselves a little bit more openly, be involved in civil society groups, maybe vote in an election, uh, and, and, and speak out in the media more openly. And you had uh, essentially um, the, uh, the re what I call the resumption of history happened in uh, around 1990 in the Arab world, that a region that had been frozen essentially politically and ideologically was frozen for half a century because of the Cold War and the Arab-Israeli conflict, in the early 90s started to evolve again. And forces that had always been there, religious sentiment, tribal forces, private sector, civil society, democracy, women's movements, groups, social uh, artists, uh, students, all of these things all existed in society, but all had been suppressed by the lids that had been <coughs> holding this region static the lids of the Arab-Israeli conflict, the state-building imperative, the Cold War, and the emergence of the modern Arab security state uh, in the 1970s. All of these things, uh, all of these things kept the region relatively static, um, and as these lids came off one by one, the region res had resumed a normal evolutionary process where individuals and groups and uh, all kinds of uh, people in society started to behave like people do in a normal society, to express themselves, to mobilize, to organize, to challenge authority, to express ideas, to work for change, to, to, re, to have a resumption of history, to have a normal historical process of change and transformation going on. And now we can see some, a few things that we couldn't really see before very clearly. We could see them, they were under the surface, but now they're up out into the public. First of all, people are expressing what they feel in various ways in the media and public opinion polls, occasionally in voting. Uh, they're expressing themselves more clearly. Um, we can see the main players in society. Uh, who are the actors now in, in, in Arab society? And there's many of them. Uh, religious groups, tribal groups, business groups, government people, political people, artists, cultural, there are all kinds of people who are active in society now. You can see the actors. Before they were mostly uh, suppressed unless they were authorized uh, by the government. Um, and we can see the connections between different aspects of life, economic pressure, political pressure, ideological issues, environmental stress, all the different aspects of life within these countries and then regional issues, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the relations with Iran, uh, foreign armies coming at us. You can now see the connections between these. We see the stakes uh, that are, we, we know what's at stake now, uh, very clearly because people are expressing their concerns um, and there's a more active political, cultural, economic and social dialogue taking place in these societies. Um, and, and therefore we have uh, uh, what I believe is a new configuration of power in the region which, is, uh, so which I would summarize by basically saying there are three uh, conglomerations of power legitimacy and authority that are now active. And you can see these through group, three groups uh, in the shorthand uh, that I call the market, the monarch, and the mosque. Uh, the market is the business sector, private enterprise, civil society, all of these groups who work independently in society. The monarch is the political authority, whether it's a republic or a, or a, a kingdom or an emirate. Uh, it doesn't matter what's the form of government, but the political authority with its multiple layers of security guards and military groups and police and armies and intelligence agencies, the massive security complexes, 
that uh, now define the modern Arab security state, uh, and all of the people linked to the governing power uh, in society. That's what I call the, the monarch for short. And the mosque is the uh, religious, uh, tribal, ethnic identities uh, that not the private sector, not the government, but these other groups in society that are uh, extremely strong uh, are now much more organized and working uh, openly. And between the market, the monarch, and the mosque, you now have three uh, broad centers of power, legitimacy, and authority that represent huge sectors of society. They're not exactly evenly matched. In some places, the government, the monarch is dominant. In some cases, the market is dominant. In some cases, the mosque and the religious tribal groups are dominant. But these three are now creating, are engaged now in a process which I believe is historic and significant in this region and is still evolving, uh, which is a balance of power among three major power centers that provides an informal form of checks and balances uh, and that provides also uh, something else which I believe is the rebirth or maybe we can talk about the birth of politics in the Arab world. For the first time in modern history, we have serious contestation of power and legitimacy and authority among groups that are operating in public, that are anchored in local society, that have huge numbers of people that uh, they represent that are seen to be legitimate, uh, that are seen to be uh, 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 responsible, uh, powerful, uh, and credible actors in society seen by their own people. And they're all, all of this is now happening in public. Uh, if you're in the Middle East, uh, if you take the time to observe what's going on, you will see all of these things uh, uh, happening. Um, and what I think is important for us to do is to understand what this means. Um, I, I'm, the title of my talk is Rights, Respect, Resistance, and Righteousness, uh, the New Middle East uh, Power Equations. Uh, rights, Respect, Resistance, and Righteousness, I believe, are four uh, words that capture some of the key themes that drive many of these actors, as well as driving uh, as well as driving some of the foreign uh, forces that intervene uh, in our societies, including uh, the American government and army and the British and Europeans and, uh, and, and many others. Uh, but first of all, I think we have to ask ourselves, how did we get here? Uh, we got here by uh, looking at, uh, we can understand how we got here by looking at a quick overview of the last 30 or 40 years, and I would mention a few, um, I'll give you just 10 headline uh, um, ideas about what forces or what criteria or conditions defined most of the Arab world uh, for most of the last two or three uh, generations. Uh, the first is that this is the only chronically and collectively non-democratic region in the world. Nowhere in the Arab world do you have a credible, serious democratic process at play. And while after the end of the Cold War you had democratic transformations in many parts of the world, we had none in the Arab world. And this is an important factor. The second point is that uh, most of the states um, in the Arab world, uh, in one way or another, are weak states. They're, they're strong governments. And the states exist and have been there for a while and will hang around for a while, but they're getting weaker in many cases uh, because the authority of the central government no longer dominates all of society as it used to 30 and 40 years ago. Uh, the third point is that the legitimacy of many of the governing powers in the Arab world is being slowly uh, uh, fraying at the edges. It's not disappearing. You still have strong, legitimate central governments with huge armies, multiple security agencies, tremendous economic power, control of uh, media resources, and, and many other things. But the legitimacy of these institutions of the central power are fraying at the edges as many other people emerge in society and play the role that the government normally plays, which is to provide people with security, with representation, with a sense of hope for the future, and a range of basic services, whether it's water, education, jobs, or whatever it may be. So the legitimacy of many 
uh, central government authorities and, uh, and, and governments are, is fraying somewhat. The fourth point is that this is a region under tremendous demographic stress. Um, the, we now have about 350 million Arabs. In 1930, there was around 60 million. Uh, a massive growth, the uh, highest population growth rate in the world. Um, 30, 40 years ago, the Arab world was mostly uh, old people, middle-aged or old people living in um, rural areas, um, poorly ser served in, in, in uh, basic uh, services. Uh, today, the Arab world is 65% urban. It's mostly urban. It's mostly young people. About 65 to 68% of the Arab population is under the age of 30. And these are people whose basic needs are pretty well met now. Uh, the state building from the 1930s to the 1980s provided a very strong infrastructural base so most people in the Arab world, especially in cities and towns, can walk to a uh, hospital or clinic, can walk to their school, can walk to a fresh water source. That basic services um, are there. It's a young, urban, well-served uh, population or, or decently served population um, which is tremendously politically frustrated because it doesn't enjoy political rights to any significant degree and is increasingly concerned about environmental and economic stress and therefore you have this tremendous demographic pressure from within society which drives many of the forces that we're seeing. The fifth point is environmental stress. Uh, this is a region uh, in which environmental management by, by the governments has been not very good uh, by and large, uh, to the point now where we're starting to see in countries like Iraq and Syria and other places environmental refugees, internally displaced environmental refugees who are moving simply because they can no longer live in their communities, the water has run out, the land is no good for farming or other reasons. And you're seeing this now in countries. Uh, and you, in a recent poll done of young people by uh, Gallup, it's about 18% of young people uh, between the ages of 15 and 29 said that they expect to have to move their place of residence in the next five years because of environmental stress, only because of environmental factors. So environmental conditions are a big problem. Uh, widening disparities uh, is a problem that we are seeing all over the region, uh, if particularly in economic terms with small groups of very wealthy, well-serviced people and growing, growing numbers of people who are more, uh, more poor. Uh, the seventh the main uh, tr the thing we can see in the region is a tradition of foreign armies that keep coming uh, into the region. Uh, the foreign armies since the days of Napoleon uh, will uh, rationalize and justify why they come into our region. The reality is from the receiving end in the Arab world, most people are fed up with foreign armies. They don't think they uh, should be uh, coming at us regularly and they don't think they make things better but they make things uh, worse. The eighth point is the unresolved Arab-Israeli conflict, which remains, I believe, the most important uh, destabilizing and radicalizing force uh, in the region. Um, the Palestinian exile now is five or six years longer than the ancient Jewish Babylonian exile, and the Palestinians in exile are now acting like the Babylonian exiles, which is recreating um, the consciousness of a nation in exile, and therefore a nation that uh, will find its way back home and restore its national rights. The mentality of exile of the Palestinians into the third generation now in Palestine as in Babylon has created a psychological and a political um, condition uh, which is redrawing the map of the Arab-Israeli conflict and you see in the behavior of groups like Hezbollah and Hamas just two signs of a different attitude towards war or peace uh, with Israel. Uh, so the Arab-Israeli conflict is a huge uh, factor and the more it re remains unresolved, the more problematic the region uh, is. The ninth point I would say is a growing sense of injustice and double standards felt by many people in the region. And the injustices and double standards that more and more people in our region feel are anchored both in local exercise of power, how Arab governments and governments in the region are treating their own people in an unfair, uh, inequitable, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, <clears throat> a brutal way, and also at injustices that we feel are coming from abroad, 
the double standards in the application of UN resolutions, access to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes, um, and the use of uh, force for political change. Many complaints are made in our region routinely about the West, but also about the Arabs and the Israelis. So this is a very common um, complaint. And number 10 point, uh, I believe that is an important indicator of how we got here, is that the rule of law, the application of the rule of law has been very erratic uh, throughout the Arab world. Uh, uh, there is rule of law, but it's applied in an erratic and inconsistent way uh, and has created a greater sense of uh, indignity among ordinary Arabs who feel that what uh, uh, what their governments are doing or what the power structures in their societies are doing is not fair to everybody, that most people don't have a fair chance to really uh, advance in life and, 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 and benefit from their education and their hard work, that the, 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 the situation is skewed to help the small group of people who hold power while the majority of other people are disadvantaged and this, uh, this erratic application of the rule of law and, and equitable power um, distribution is a major point that has driven protest movements uh, and activism around the Arab world, particularly uh, Islamist movements uh, who have uh, <coughs> become very strong uh, and are uh, critical of their own governments as, as they are critical of Israel and Western powers, but they're the main driving force of most of the Islamist movements uh, in, the, in the modern period has been uh, domestic uh, imbalances social inequity, uh, abuse of power, uh, corruption, um, unfair application of uh, state assets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so those 10 points, I think, are the main ones, as many, many others, uh, but I think they uh, help uh, explain why is it that this region is so turbulent and is so uh, violent in many uh, situations, uh, and, and why is it, in, in many cases, why the uh, governments and the power structures in many of our countries have responded to these stresses by becoming more autocratic uh, and, 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 and dominating society to a greater degree and not opening up and liberalizing as many other countries did around the world after the end of the Cold War, but rather tightening their controls. The consequences of these trends and other ones are pretty clear to see. There's a wide spread fear and vulnerability among a sense of fear and vulnerability among many people uh, in the area. Uh, they feel that uh, they are increasingly vulnerable to economic stress, foreign armies, their own uh, systems, their own security systems, uh, criminal activity, uh, environmental pressures, uh, all kinds of reasons why people should be uh, more and more uh, concerned, particularly young people worried about getting a job and having an opportunity to live a decent life. <clears throat> and second consequence is that this is a region widely riddled with violence as a normal means of political expression. And the violence is practiced by uh, three main groups. Um, the governments and political structures of this region use violence against their own people or against neighbors. Opposition groups and terror groups use violence. And foreign armies and invading forces use violence. And these three main groups have now created this cycle of, of violence, which is a common uh, vocabulary of political conduct uh, throughout the Middle East. A third consequence is the fragmentation of the central power and authority that used to define the, most of the countries in this region. If you had come to the Middle East, and this applies to Turkey, Iran, the Arab countries, if you had come there in 1950 or 1960, you essentially had to deal with one central government which controlled everything, the military, the police, the economy, the media, the schools, they controlled everything. If you go to the most Arab countries today, you have to, there is no one central authority that controls everything. Even in government, even in countries where the government is very strong, like Jordan, like Turkey, like Morocco, where you have a strong, uh, tough, uh, credible, legitimate central government, but even there, they don't have the control of, that they used to. People get their media information from other sources than the government. They get a lot of their services from the private sector and NGOs. Uh, a lot of people turn to non-government forces for even the representation of their very identity, whether they turn to Islamist groups or to tribal groups or to ethnic leaderships or private uh, corporate groups. They, they don't necessarily turn to the government as the main uh, group that represents them 
but there's other groups that compete for, for this kind of uh, authority. Um, you have therefore many new actors emerging in society, uh, non-state actors is how they were traditionally called, but I would say that they're actually parallel state actors. You have now groups like the Muslim Brothers, like Hezbollah, like Hamas in Palestine, uh, some of the big tribal federations and, and tribal organizations, some of the private sector corporations, um, uh, even some big NGOs in some countries. You have a whole range of groups that now are active in society openly, publicly, legally, and they operate at a level in which they do similar services to what the governments used to do, including providing security, providing political representation, negotiating with foreign uh, powers, and therefore you have a whole bunch of new actors who are not just non-state actors, they're parallel state actors. We have a very strange phenomenon in the Arab world where you have multiple authorities and single sovereignties. So in Lebanon, for instance, you have Hezbollah and you have the government. In Palestine, you have Hamas, you have Fatah. Uh, in, uh, in Somalia, you have a whole range of different uh, people. Uh, in Iraq, you've got all kinds of groups now emerging. So you have these multiple uh, centers of power and authority and legitimacy and service delivery who coexist very easily. They're not fighting each other to take over. They're not necessarily, uh, it's not a zero-sum game where only one group is going to emerge. That's how it used to be back in the 50s and 60s. But now there's more sophistication, maybe just more weariness, whatever. But people now are much more nuanced about coexisting with different power structures and power authorities uh, working alongside each other. And they sometimes share power, as in the government in Lebanon. You have Hezbollah, you have uh, the Hariri-led March 14 groups, and they're part of the same government, uh, half of which is aligned with Iran, half of which is aligned with the United States. So the Lebanese government is the first Iranian-American joint venture in political governance in the Arab world. But it exists, and it works, and people uh, find it very natural. Uh, similarly, in Palestine, at one point, Hamas and Fatah were in a unity government, and they split up. They'll come back at some point one day. And, and you find this going on in Yemen, in Somalia, in Egypt, and every, all over the place. You find this process of different <coughs> legitimate groups uh, competing with each other, but then coming together uh, when, they, uh, when, they, when they need to. Another trend, a consequence of this, is that you have now many different conflicts in the region. A region that used to be dominated and defined by the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Cold War, and that was about it. Those were the two major conflicts. The Middle East now is defined by a, a wide range of conflicts, internally within countries uh, like Yemen, like Somalia, like Lebanon, like Palestine. Uh, then you have problems uh, in Iraq, obviously. Then you have conflicts between countries, the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, tensions between Syria and Lebanon, which now have eased, but they come and go. Uh, tensions between Arab countries and Iran. Uh, and many of these uh, internal conflicts, as in Lebanon and, and Yemen and Palestine and Iraq, are proxy battles for bigger conflicts between Iran and the United States and other groups. So you have a whole range of conflicts now that uh, take place in the region. And they've all come together in a kind of regional Cold War. So it's impossible now for somebody to go in, as they used to try to do before, to say, OK, we're going to try to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict. You can't solve the Arab-Israeli conflict unless you address Syria, Lebanon, Iran, uh, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, Syria. There's many different tensions and conflicts that have to be addressed now uh, collectively. And this is part of the complexity of this region, which comes about because we've had this process going on for decades and decades and decades. And again, the Arab-Israeli conflict is the single most destabilizing and problematic reason for the uh, degradation of the stability and security of the area. There's other reasons. It's not the only one, but it's the oldest and the most serious reason why you have all of these problems. Imagine if the Arab-Israeli conflict had been solved in 1975. Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah probably wouldn't exist. They came into existence in the early 80s mainly as a response to Israeli occupation. Uh, the Iranian-Israeli tension probably wouldn't uh, be there. Um, so there's many reasons why you have um, um, uh, a clear link between the continuation of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the security problems and pressures that you can see in many other parts 
uh, of, the, of the region. Um, another important uh, thing that, uh, f a trend that we can see is as a, as a response to many of these developments, there is a new sense of kind of what I would call defiance. Uh, some people talk of resistance, uh, but you have hundreds of millions of people uh, in the Arab world and Iran, uh, you have uh, something like 500 million people. Um, out of those 500 million people, the vast majority in the last 25 or 30 years have asserted uh, in public their political and personal views and, and worked actively to try to change conditions that they complain about, whether it's their own domestic political autocracy, foreign intervention, Arab-Israeli wars, occupations, economic disparities, whatever is the reason of their complaint, what you have, and I would say this is the single most important political development in our region in the last two generations, is the end of docility, that, that huge numbers of people, and I would say we're talking here of two to four hundred million people, are no longer willing to acquiesce in the conditions that they have inherited of occupation, of foreign subjugation, of domestic inequity, political abuse, corruption, lack of democracy, fixed elections, uh, the kinds of things that they've suffered internally and regionally and, and globally, and they're trying to do something about it. Uh, and, they, and this is why you have all of these actors, Islamist movements, democracy movements, human rights movements, civil society groups, uh, student groups, women's groups, professionals, lawyers associations. There's all kinds of mechanisms that people have used, including violent actions by small militants and terrorist groups, uh, militia groups, uh, there's all kinds of uh, different groups doing different things, but the single common denominator, I believe, that's important for us uh, is that there is no longer a docile, acquiescent population uh, in the Arab Islamic region of the Middle East that is willing to, uh, to be uh, docile in the face of its own subjugation or occupation or marginalization or pauperization. And this is what... Uh, we're seeing, I think, in all of these groups that are much more active and much more dynamic uh, in society. Another uh, impact of all of these things has been the um, role of the United States is particularly important, I think. Uh, the United States is uh, the biggest international power and it is actively involved in the Middle East with its army, with its diplomacy, with its economic aid and many different ways, but uh, the striking thing about the U.S. in the Middle East, I believe, is the fact that the vast majority of people in that region, and I'm talking here of Arabs, Israelis, Turks, and Iranians, the vast majority neither respect nor fear the United States anymore. This is a, 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 a strong statement, I know, but I think it is probably uh, correct. Uh, and if you look at how the United States has behaved in the last, say, 15 years, and this is a recent phenomenon. If you look at how the United States has behaved with the Arabs, with the Israelis, with the Turks, with the Iranians, threatening them, cajoling them, trying to buy them off. Now, the recent, uh, most recent yesterday, the U.S. said it's given up its uh, attempt to uh, get the Israelis to free settlements, which they tried to do by pressure and they tried to do by buying them off, and in neither case were they able to do it, and the U.S. just backed away. They tried to pressure the Turks and different things. That the Turks stood up to them, wouldn't let the Americans go into Iraq through Turkey. They've had sanctions and all kinds of threats against Iran and Syria, which has just emboldened Iran uh, and Syria. And they've used all kinds of pressures and, and uh, policies uh, to get the Arabs to be compliant. And while many Arab governments have been compliant with the U.S., a lot of people in the Arab world have become much more defiant. And this is a very, very significant situation which I think needs to be studied much more carefully. I believe it is, it is fair to say that a majority of people in our region neither respect nor fear the United States. And this is a, a shock, I think, if you're an American citizen or the American government. Uh, if people neither fear you nor respect you, then you have virtually no influence. And I think this is the situation in the United States has found itself in. Uh, it's waged two wars and is quickly trying to get out of both of them. It's trying to use its diplomatic efforts and in no case has it had any significant success with the Israelis, with the Arabs, with the Iranians. Uh, it's a very serious problem for the United States and I think it is part of the 
bigger picture that I'm trying to draw, which is in the old days, when all you had to do was deal with a bunch of Arab leaders, then the Arab countries did everything you wanted them to do. Or a non-democratic Iran or a non-democratic Turkey, it was very easy for you to just deal with these leaders and, you, and everything was hunky-dory, especially during the Cold War. The situation has changed radically that large numbers of people in all of these societies, including in Israel, which is a very strong American ally, the Israelis will not be dictated to by the United States, and they'll stand up to it, and we just saw a very good example uh, of it. And part of the reason for this, I believe, um, I mentioned many different factors, environmental, political discontent, lack of democracy, foreign armies, occupations, etc. But I think that if there's a single uh, reason within the region I would say that it is the pauperization of the region and the demographic transition. We're dealing now with a region that is, I said, uh, about 65% under the age of 30. This is a very young region um, and it's highly urbanized and like I said, ba basic needs are met. People can walk to school in a health center. They're not starving. Nobody is dying of lack of vaccination. Uh, uh, but they feel that uh, their, uh, their biological survival uh, is not matched by a response to their basic need for human dignity and, more importantly, their sense of citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen of a country? That you can vote in a non-rigged election, that you can make your voice heard, that you can hold your government accountable, that there can be a normal process of give and take in society. People have not felt that their citizenship rights have been exercised um, and, and they're responding to that. But most of all, I believe the single most important factor is the economic stress. Uh, and in the last uh, 25, 30 years, this has been one of the most important but understudied uh, factors, I believe, in the entire transformation of this region. And I want to give you just two statistics. Um, one is for the entire, um, for the entire Arab world. This is World Bank data from last year. If you take the 22 Arab countries and you look at the gross domestic product in constant prices, in constant prices, in other words, adjusted for inflation. Um, in the decade of the 1980s, the um, per capita GDP, which is a rough measure of average wealth. The per capita GDP in the 1980s averaged over that decade was $2,671. In this decade, from 2000 to 2009, that figure of $2,671 after 20 years has dropped to $2,557. This is adjusted per capita real income, uh, real GDP per capita. And this is a shocking um, uh, situation, and this is for the entire Arab world. If you take away the oil states, the wealthy, and you, take away, and you leave just the poorer countries, Egypt, Morocco, Sudan, uh, etc., Yemen, uh, you're dealing with a region that has been poor for a long time and continues to get poorer. And this is one of the greatest problems. Let me give you one more, more dramatic example. If you take the country of Jordan, just one country, and you take that critical decade from the mid-80s to the mid-90s, which I believe is the critical decade, which co coincides with the economic stress in the Arab world in the mid-80s, the end of the Cold War, and then the transitional years after that, from 1985 to 1995, in one country, Jordan, which is a pretty normal country, it's not an oil state, it's not a completely desolate, poor state. It's a pretty normal place, and those of you who know Jordan know that it's a nice place, and, and it's pleasant, and, and the people are dynamic, and they're friendly. But between 1985 and 1995, if you take the gross domestic product per capita in Jordan, and you just take those dinar figures which the government gives you, and then you translate them into constant prices in U.S. dollars. And the reason you have to do it in U.S. dollars is because most of what Jordan consumes, like most of the Arab world, is imported. Airplanes, fuel, furniture, computers, food, most of it is imported. So you have to denominate it in dollars to see what is the actual real income or purchasing power 
of an average citizen. In that period between 85 and 95 in Jordan, the GDP per capita in constant US dollars declined from 2,244 to 908. It's an unbelievable drop. Uh, you don't hear these figures very much because people in the Middle East tend not to like to talk about this reality. But this is the reality that we're dealing with, whether it's at the macro level of the entire region or if you, and if you take this same exercise and do it for any other country in the region, you're going to get uh, a similar range of uh, views. And therefore, you have a situation today where across the region, uh, and here I'm talking now about only the Arab world, though leaving out Israel, Iran, and Turkey for a moment, and across the Arab world, you have a huge young population that is suffering this kind of economic stress with the environmental stress, with the domestic political uh, constraints, with the regional tensions and frustrations of the Arab-Israeli conflict, with the international pressures of foreign armies and, and uh, the perception that the UN and the world, the West, are applying double standards. When you put all of these things together, you end up with a population of a mostly young, uh, very frustrated and worried people. But more than just being frustrated and worried, we're dealing with a young population that in more and more cases is gradually detaching itself from the anchorage of its own society. And I think if you look at the most interesting data that uh, I think we have today, is a poll that was just done by the Gallup organization uh, a poll of youth in every single Arab country, aged 15 to 29. <clears throat> and the polling done by Gallup for a group in Qatar called Silatec, which deals with transitions of young people from education to employment. The, the Arab youth's polling that has been done has given us some really important indications of the reality of young people who are the majority of people, but I think the youth's perceptions reflect the wider perceptions of all Arab society, showing the reality which is that you have serious pressures, concerns, vulnerabilities, fears, worries, serious ones, combined with powerful forces for self-confidence, hope for the future, a sense of security, and this is the reality of the Arab world, which is so important uh, to grasp. Why at the same time do you have evidence of uh, violence, uh, extremism, dysfunctional behavior, etc., etc., combined with this uh, strong uh, sense of, of stability? But let me just give you a few uh, statistics from, remember this is talking about young people in the entire Arab countries, 22 countries with nationally representative uh, samples by, by Gallup. Uh, um, the 90% of young people feel that they actually are free to express themselves. This is really important. Uh, they feel they have the freedom to speak, partly because of the new information technology, internet and cell phones and stuff. They can express themselves, which people in my generation before couldn't do so easily. They uh, feel they are 65% roughly are satisfied with the freedoms in their life to do whatever they want, which is quite significant, uh, about two-thirds of them almost. Um, there are positive uh, elements like 86%, the overwhelming majority, feel that if they are in a moment of need, that they have people in their immediate environment, family, friends, cousins, neighbors, uh, NGOs, charitable societies, they have people who will help them immediately. That they feel, 86% feel that they have somebody who can immediately help them if they need something. Along, then you have something like 88% uh, to 90% feel that religion and family are important forces in their society or, or they can rely on those forces. So you have some strong indicators of a large number of young Arabs who are not desperate, who feel that they have protection, they have anchorage in society that they can turn to. It's not the government. Uh, it's mostly family, friends, religion, neighbors, etc. Uh, but though to be fair also, uh, about 70% or so say that they are content 
they feel that their environment that they live in, in their town or village or, or city, they're satisfied with it. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, five-star luxury, but they're, they're satisfied. They think that they're living in decent conditions. Um, yet, the negative uh, aspects are uh, equally uh, striking. 30% uh, 30, uh, 30 only feel that they can find good affordable housing. They're worried about, they don't have, they can't find affordable housing, they can't get married. Um, they're particularly worried about housing as an impediment to leaving youth, childhood, and becoming adults. 30% um, on average across the region want to immigrate permanently to go to another country. Um, and this 30% is for the regional average. It goes up to 45% in some cases like Algeria and others. It goes up to 45 and a little more. But 30 is the entire regional average. If one third of your young people who are educated, who are the most productive element in society, one third of these people want to leave, that's a bad sign. And they would leave if they could, but most of them can't. Nobody will take them. They, won't, they can't get visas. Um, you have a problem... Um, with uh, confidence in the integrity of the central government. Uh, about 50%, 51% say that they have, uh, well, it's been 51 and 53, uh, because you have males and females that differ, but they, about 51 or 53% feel they have confidence in the central government. In other words, almost half of the young people have no confidence in their central government. Uh, same thing for the judiciary. About 53% have confidence in the judiciary. About 47% don't. Um, only 45% have confidence in the media. The young people have completely turned away from their mass media. They don't follow it. They, don't, you, they, they, they create their own media. This is one of the results of a youth study that we have just uh, completed. Only 40% of young people in the Arab world believe that elections held in their country are honest. 60% feel that elections are a sham. Um, these are very strong, clear, accurate, uh, dispassionate indicators of societies and stress. Uh, and I've mentioned the main reasons uh, that I think help us to understand how we got here. I think what, can, we, we, what we can see now uh, is that there are many um, actors in societies, in our societies, who are behaving uh, in a way that represents their desire to change things, to address some of these problems and pressures. And again, there's a multitude of different actors. Each one is motivated by something else. Religious groups, tribal groups, private sector, political, militant, all kinds of groups. But the reality is that they're all working at once, and what you have for the first time is a dynamic situation of change and transformation in which these groups, as I said, coalesce into three broad categories, the monarchy, the mosque, and the, and the, and the market. Uh, and they give us a bit of a balancing uh, act now, which creates a little bit of stability. Now, we have a stable system. It, it's a dynamic but stable system. Uh, but this is a transitional moment. This situation isn't going to last for a long time. And people are talking about the four R's that I mentioned. People are demanding their rights, they're demanding respect, and the respect they're demanding is from their own authorities as well as from foreigners, whether it's Hamas demanding respect from Israel or Syria demanding respect from the United States or somebody demanding respect from uh, somebody else. The respect is the, the, the respect is probably the single greatest common denominator among all of these actors. Uh, it's an intangible element of being, of being treated fairly, being treated decently, of being allowed to behave as a human being and as a citizen, not to be treated like an animal or a second-class person. And this demand for respect is oriented to people's own governments and societies, as well as foreign, foreign ones. So respect is, is incredibly important. Resistance is what many people say they are doing in the Arab world and Iran, resisting uh, forces that they believe threaten them, whether it's Israeli forces occupying them, or Americans, or British Army, or Arab conservative forces, or private sector 
dominating corporations, whatever. They have many accusations against many people. But resistance is the term that people use now. Uh, and, and, and the Syrians and the Iranians and others are uh, uh, grouping themselves with a range of different organizations in our societies. And they call themselves the Resistance and Deterrence Front. You, you may think this is crazy. You may like it. You may not like it. I have my own views. I'm not saying this is great or bad. I'm just saying this is how things are, and this is how they see themselves. Um, and they feel that they're actually doing well, uh, that their points are, they're making uh, uh, scoring points and holding their ground and forcing others to deal with them. And finally, righteousness. And righteousness is something that both the American army, um, the Israeli army, and Arab resistance forces claim. Righteousness is the common language uh, of people who are active and trying to um, achieve their rights uh, as citizens uh, and claiming divine uh, support. It's interesting that Israelis and Americans and Arabs and Turks and Iranians all uh, speak in the same language. So I finish by just saying that when we, this is a very quick uh, superficial uh, overview of trying to give you the complexity of these issues, but in the final analysis, what are we talking about? What are the issues? What are the problems? What does this tell us about Arab society and Middle Eastern society as a whole? It tells us that there's a range of issues that are now being contested, that the people of the region have put on the table, have put on the public agenda. And the issues are big sticker items. Statehood is a contested issue. The states of this region are not stable in many cases and are changing, and people are looking at statehood and trying to fix it up. Sovereignty is an issue that many people are uh, contesting, challenging. Uh, many people feel that they're independent, but they're not sovereign, that somebody else really tells them what to do. Nationhood is an issue that is uh, up for grabs. Uh, people talk of the Islamic nation, the Arab nation, uh, they talk of their own countries, they talk of tribal allegiances. The idea of belonging to a bigger nation um, is, is very much discussed. The exercise of power and the legitimacy of governance, and the two things go together. Power and governance and legitimacy um, are uh, central themes of what is going on. The issue of identity. People are expressing their multiple identities, religious, tribal, professional, political, ideological, social, cultural, all kinds of identities are now actively um, on the table. Uh, citizenship rights, what does it mean to be a citizen of a country? What are the limits to the power of the government to intervene in your life? Human development issues, access to basic needs. As I said, most basic needs are, are reasonably well met, but now there's growing concern, particularly in environmental terms and in quality of education and jobs. Uh, security and stability uh, are important issues. Uh, a lot of societies are, are stable, but they're not secure. There's bombings, there's foreign invasions, there's occupations, there's criminal activity, there's terrorism, there's all kinds of threats to security. And finally, relations with the rest of the world. Um, we don't really know, we don't really know if a majority of Arabs wants to make war with Israel or wants to make peace with Israel. Uh, and we don't really know if a majority of Israelis wants to make war or peace with the Palestinians. We really don't know that. We have certain ideas, but these are not clear. The relationships of the people of this region with foreign actors is very much um, imprecise, very vague, and needs to be clarified. We don't know if the majority of people in the Arab world think the United States is their friend or the United States is a threat. We know that both views are there. And we don't know really how many Arabs think Iran is right in doing what it's doing and how many Arabs fear Iran. There's different views. And there's views of governments and there's views of ordinary people and there's views of political groups in the Arab world. There's a range. Um, all of these issues uh, are now issues that are being publicly discussed. Um, we have this very important historic transition taking place in the Arab world which is woefully underreported and not well understood, I think, internationally, because people don't take the time to look into our society and to understand, well, what's going on at the community level? What's going on in the minds and hearts of ordinary people? 
Why are people violent? Why are they extremists? Why are they emotional? Why do they do what they do? Um, and I think it's important for institutions like yours and, and ours and academics and journalists to, to make a greater effort to understand uh, that uh, we have in the Arab world, in the Middle East, a resumption of history uh, and possibly a birth of politics. And this should be a meeting point for those of us like myself, certainly, and I hope many of you, who believe that there shouldn't be hostility between Arabs and Americans, that the basic fundamental uh, values of American society and of Arab Islamic society are identical values. They focus on justice and equality and, and um, uh, consent of the governed, majority will and protecting minority rights. These are themes that are very common uh, in the Islamist religious political discourse in our region uh, and very common uh, in the American public discourse. So there should be a much greater meeting ground between people in the Arab world and the wider Islamic Middle East and Israel and the United States. And I think we have to make an effort to try to achieve that. But the first step to doing that is to understand more accurately what is actually happening on the ground. And I hope that I've given you some uh, insights into some of these issues. Thank you very much for being here. Great. We have about uh, 15, 20 minutes for questions. If you're able, can you talk to the mic to the recording on the uh, video that's going right at the mic as well, right? For the people sitting on the side of the room. Questions, yes. The picture you give concerning youth is uh, the volatility, the volatility of the situation. Hold, hold the mic up, yeah. Okay. The volatility of the situation is best expressed in what the statistics you've given about the youth. And it definitely is very much anchored in the pauperization of the society as a whole, which the youth particularly. This does not fully apply to the Gulf region, where the youth are undergoing also, I mean, from uh, material that I work on and I know of, the youth itself is undergoing quite a lot of the issue of the need to voice. Of what? To voice, to have a say. And this is the beginning of that. Do you sense that sort of differentiation in the Arab world? I mean, the Gulf region is not exactly the same story that you have given in the other parts of the Arab world. That, that's right, and I didn't have enough time, but the statistics are, if you go to the Gallup report, the Silitech is online, it's very, very uh, uh, important data, and it's differentiated into high-income, middle-income, and low-income countries. So, for instance, the desire to immigrate, I said it's 30% across the board on average, in the Gulf countries it's only about 5 or 6%. Because they're wealthy, they feel that their needs are met, there's no need to immigrate, they can get jobs automatically. Uh, in the uh, non-oil countries, the poor countries, it's 40% uh, or, or higher. So the average is 30. So there clearly is a differentiation. This is not a uniform region. There are big differences, with, and the differences are mainly uh, based on income. Uh, you, f you find that gender, uh, there are some differences based on gender, there are some differences based on geographical location, but it's income that is the main defining factor that creates differences in people's attitudes or, uh, or behavior. And people in the Gulf, uh, you know, the Gulf region, we have to be um, aware. I mean, they've only really been developing at a serious national level for probably two generations. I mean, it's only really since the 50s or 60s, um, or even some of them even later than that, uh, with the oil boom, that they really started developing on a national scale. Others, the Saudis and Kuwaitis from the 50s, and but uh, these are young countries. Um, and they've been so absorbed in a rapid process of state building, uh, and in many cases making a lot of money, that they haven't paid attention to other issues. But I think we're now seeing among people in the Gulf and other places signs of a desire, even among wealthy people, uh, that they want to manifest all of their human um, dimensions to think, to speak, to read different opinions, to have a view on things, to have a debate, to have a discussion. They shouldn't be prevented from doing these things. So I think we're seeing signs of that, but it's strongest in the, in the poorer countries, definitely. 
thanks for that very interesting talk, Rami. Uh, I also have a question about the Gulf states. You had the model in which you described the monarch, the market, and the mosque as, as emerging in a, in a, uh, as an analog to a checks and balances system. But in the Gulf, I was thinking, uh, similar to, to the question you just raised, that my, my conception, at least historically, was that they functioned more like the three pillars of, of, of uh, ruling coalition, in the sense that uh, the mosque legitimated the monarch, and the monarch's relatives had a commanding role in the market. And so I was going to ask, uh, particularly on the, with respect to the relationship between the mosque and the monarch in uh, the Gulf states, whether you see significant uh, changes over the past decade in the, uh, you know, in the opinions of sort of ordinary, uh, uh, ordinary Muslims and the, the leaders of the clerical establishment, whether you see uh, uh, that change as having implications for the political order in those countries. Um, okay, is, the, is this mic on? Can you hear it if I just speak like this? Is this for Homeland Security? No, I'm just joking. That's a joke. That was, that was a joke if anybody from Homeland Security was listening. Uh, um, the, um, the Gulf is very different, clearly, because of the um, uh, wealth, uh, the young age of these countries, the small size of them. Um, I made a calculation a few years ago, uh, which was a little bit sort of mean, not mean, but a little sensitive, but, it, but I made a calculation, this was back in the, in the 70s, that in one small Gulf state, which I will not mention, that you could put the entire population of the indigenous natives on the fleet of one major international airline. Uh, and so you're not dealing with large populations. You're dealing with very small uh, populations, very young countries, actively involved in not just state building, but creating an identity. And you have great variations across the region, there's no doubt. Uh, about it. Uh, how you take some Gulf countries like Kuwait, and if you look at the election results, or Bahrain, you see the uh, involvement of the powerful uh, role of the, um, of the monarchy, the political authority. You see the religious groups either aligned with the authority or in some cases more conservative than it and challenging it, or uh, uh, involved in some Islamist political parties, which you can see in places like Kuwait or Bahrain. Um, where you have some public politics. In other countries, you don't have public politics, uh, uh, and you don't have any kind of public uh, activism at a political level. It just doesn't exist. In countries like Qatar, UAE, Oman, there is no political infrastructure. Uh, but in Kuwait, in Bahrain, uh, in Saudi Arabia to some extent, you see uh, signs of this. And it manifests itself through the Islamic groups and manifests itself through business groups, the private sector, and through the ruling elite. So it, it varies a lot. There isn't one model. I just mentioned these three groups as the three broad conglomerations of power and legitimacy and authority that you can see in every, uh, in every country. Hello. Thanks for that talk. I'm uh, wondering if you would uh, uh, have some idea of how much um, money from the U.S., uh, you know, uh, take all the money and all the military that's been there, and how many Arabs has that money killed? How many what? Arabs has that money killed? Uh, you could probably... It's hard to trace it back to any one country. Uh, you really uh, have to spread the blame around, I think. Uh, clearly, um, there's a problem with Arab governments spending hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars on buying imported arms from the U.S. And the U.S. is the biggest exporter, but Russia, the Europeans, everybody sells. Uh, and, and in the end, when they feel a little threat, they feel threatened, as recently we saw in the WikiLeaks, some Arab leaders worried about Iran, they go to the U.S. and they say, please, do the job for us. Or even they turn to the, they say, if the Israelis are going to do it, let them do it quickly. So I think there's a question about, you know, the, the armaments that uh, have been bought from the U.S. and others, how, how much use are they? Um, I think the question of how many people have died and who is responsible for that 
really has to be seen in the context of uh, culpability that has to be shared by many people. I think uh, um, the main ones would be the, the uh, Arab governments and the Israeli government in terms of wars and active killings. Um, you have to really look within the region. And then the United States has a role, the British have a role. I mean, you can blame the British and the French for a lot of historical hangovers. Uh, the fact that we have all these tensions and, uh, and conflicts is partly due to the historical legacy. So there's a lot of blame uh, to go around, but I think... Say it within the last 10 years? Pardon? Within the last 10 years. Well, in the last 10 years, if you're talking about the war in Iraq and other things, then you're probably talking of... Uh, a couple of hundred thousand people possibly, but who knows? I mean, this is contested, but a lot. I mean, a lot of people have been uh, killed. I think we, we really, we need to do these analyses very accurately and carefully. It's really important to make sure that when, if we do a calculation like that and say, okay, we can blame the U.S. for this amount of dead Arabs. If that can be done, it really needs to be done with, with great care. I couldn't possibly give you a figure uh, right now. I mean, even the number of Iraqis that have been killed is disputed. The scholars who study these things uh, keep having different uh, formula for how to calculate the number of people who have died, and, and of those who died, how many can be blamed on uh, Iraqi causes, um, other uh, regional players. Uh, and if you talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict, then where do you put the blame? On the Arab leaders, on Israel? On, so it's very, very... Uh, complicated, and I, I think you know one of our challenges is to understand the problems that have brought us here. We, to understand these forces, that's what I tried to do a little bit. Say, well, here's a bunch of reasons how we got here, but I think we really have to focus on how do we get out of this mess, uh, and we get out of this mess, I think, by uh, basically uh, trying to apply the rule of law evenly for everybody, to have one standard of law and morality, uh, and that applies to UN resolutions. It applies to peaceful use of nuclear energy. It applies to security guarantees. It applies to national self-determination. I mean, in all of these areas, Arabs, Israelis, Iranians, Turks, Cypriots, Americans, everybody needs to feel that they are being uh, treated according to a single common standard of law and morality. And that's not the case. And that's why we have uh, all of these uh, tensions. Um, so I think it's really critical to understand the, the issues of how we got here and the waste of money and human deaths, etc. Uh, but, but not to get stuck in that and to try to figure out, well, how do we prevent that from happening again? You know, you know hundreds of thousands of people have died in the Middle East in the last two generations. So how do we reduce that death toll uh, as we look ahead? Questions regarding Lebanon and the issues in Lebanon that could potentially uh, influence the broader Middle East. The first question is regarding the Hariri assassination and the recent uh, issues with the tribunal that have gotten even its neighbors talking, including Israel. Um, how do you see the, the tribunal affecting not only Lebanon but the broader Middle East? Uh, specifically, what are your predictions on what the tribunal will? Uh, discover and and what are the effects of it? And then my second question is regarding WikiLeaks, a uh, specific WikiLeak that came out last night uh, about Saudi Arabia wanting to develop an Arab army to counter Hezbollah. Do you see that as uh, feasible? Number one and number two, uh, is that an an inner Arab conflict, a conflict between Iran and the Arabs, or? a conflict between pro-Western and anti-Western forces in the region. Uh, which was that last one? Pro-Western forces in the region. The, which conflict are you talking about, Lebanon or? Uh, the, the, the idea that Saudi Arabia wants to develop an Arab army. Uh, to, to fight Hezbollah. OK, I, I just heard about that briefly. I haven't actually read the, uh, uh, the story. There's a lot of people in the Arab world who are critical of Hezbollah. Um, Saudi Arabia hinted back in the 2006 war when Israel was fighting Hezbollah, the Saudis made a hint uh, that uh, uh, Hezbollah shouldn't have done this, that they were critical of Hezbollah. And many people in the Arab world openly criticize Hezbollah now. Um, excuse my eating, uh, I have a bit of an allergy, so I'm 
I'm not being disrespectful, but I don't want to lose my voice. Or maybe some of you want me to lose my voice, but <laughs> too late. Uh, um, there's many people who are critical of Hezbollah. And, and this, I said that you have this alignment of groups in this kind of new Cold War in the region with the Iranians, the uh, Syrians, Hezbollah, Hamas, nationalists, uh, all kinds of groups on one side. On the other side, you have conservative Arab groups, the U.S., Europeans, sometimes with Israel, different alignments of uh, pro-Western forces in the Arab world who are critical of the Islamists, critical of Iran. They are now fighting each other in many different ways, sometimes actively militarily when there's a military fight like in Yemen or, or in Lebanon once or twice, but they do it mostly ideologically through the media, um, culturally and, and uh, diplomatically and in other ways. And you know, if the, I don't know if this tr the report about the Saudis is true. It shouldn't be surprising. The Saudis have expressed their concerns about movements like Hezbollah. The Saudis have clearly expressed their concerns about what Iran is doing. And we have, thanks to the U.S. invasion of Iraq, we have allowed what had been a low-intensity Shia-Sunni theological tension and cultural tension to emerge into a full-blown public exercise of ethnic cleansing and, 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 and barbarism on both sides, people in Iraq particularly. But you see in other places killing each other just because they're Sunnis and Shias. We never had this kind of level of um, conflict in the Arab world before. Um, the tensions that were there between Sunnis and Shiites were, 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 were of a different nature. Um, and so this is just a reflection of this bigger problem that we have, the Iranian uh, influence with various uh, Shiite Arab groups. But it's not just Shiites, because Iran is close to Hamas, and there's many Arabs who are not uh, Shiites who like what Iran is doing. So I think we've got to be very careful about the you know, Saudi Hezbollah or Shiite Sunni attention. They're much broader uh, uh, than that. I don't, I, Hezbollah is a very strong group, uh, but it is not invincible. If, if, if people want to create armies to fight it, and if you get a coalition of Arabs and, uh, and uh, Israelis and Americans and Westerners who want to fight Hezbollah, they can probably defeat it one day, and there's a sm small number of people. Uh, will, but the damage would be so enormous that it would uh, set off a regional conflagration, probably. So I don't think there's a military solution to the political reality that Hezbollah represents. Uh, Hezbollah represents a political reality, which I alluded to briefly, of this sense of defiance uh, and, and de of resistance that demands respect to achieve rights. And I think that, com that linear process of resistance and a sense of righteousness to achieve, to, to get respect, to achieve your rights, is what helps us understand a lot of what's going on in the Middle East. The, the answer, I think, the better answer is to ask, well, what is Hezbollah uh, trying to do? What does Hezbollah represent? And other groups like it in the region. What do the Iranians want? Uh, not to uh, just say these are bad people or they're evil people or they're terrorists or whatever, um, or point out some statement they made in 1982 and say they're anti-Semites or they're anti-this or they're anti-that. Say, so what do they want? By talking to them, first of all, and understanding what they want, and then saying, okay, here's uh, 10 things that they say they want. How many of those things are reasonable and legitimate? Is there an international consensus for what they're asking for? Or are they just outrageously crazy, violent people? I think that kind of exercise is much more useful to engage them in some kind of process that provides for all sides what I said before, the application of a single standard of law and morality for Iran, for Israel, for Hezbollah, for Saudi Arabia, for the US, for everybody. That's a much better way to try to address the issue than you know, getting armies to um, attack people. And the cost of, uh, of, of, of regional warfare now will be much, much higher than anything that we've, we've seen before. The Lebanon uh, tribunal issue is a very significant historical issue. It represents the uh, culmination of tensions and pressures that I believe have been building up in the region for a uh, couple of hundred years. The uh, Hezbollah represents the, the, represents the high watermark of indigenous Islamic Arab nationalist resistance to Western intervention. And the tribunal is a symbolic representation of uh, a century of Western intervention uh, in our region, and the two are now clashing. 
the tribunal is a Security Council unanimous, legitimate uh, resolution being implemented to find the killers of Hariri and hold them accountable in a fair court. Uh, the majority of Lebanese want that to happen. They don't want these killings to go on. Um, but there are people who are critical of what the tribunal is doing, Hezbollah and others. They've raised serious objections. So I think it's a, you have to separate the political process from the legal process somehow. Holding people accountable to the rule of law needs to be done. But it's got to be done on the basis of a convincing process of investigation, production of evidence, and holding a trial. There are serious complaints about whether this process up to now has been fair, transparent, and equitable. And these complaints need to be addressed. They're serious complaints. Um, you can't uh, uh, railroad this uh, tribunal and just ram it down the throats of uh, people. Um, so I think this is a, a complicated process that needs to be separated from political and legal issues. It's also become a symbol of this wider regional Cold War. The Syrians and, the, and Hezbollah believe that the tribunal and the investigation were designed from the beginning to, to get the Syrians and to get Hezbollah. And therefore, they're fighting back. So it's extremely complicated, very delicate moment. If it's not handled well, uh, it could lead to, again, great uh, problems fighting in Lebanon, which might spread to other places. The good news is that the Syrians and the Saudis, the two poles of Arab ideology, are working together very closely to minimize the potential for an explosion. They understand how serious it would be if it happened. They're working together very closely to minimize that. Uh, and there's active engagement with the Iranians and the Lebanese and the Americans and everybody. So it's an extremely complicated situation. I believe that they will come up with a solution that allows for a reasonable um, implementation of justice. Right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, what a small gift. Thank you for the surprise and the ubiquitous.